So like five o'clock. Like awesome. perfect. Thank you. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Okay. So um, I want you to listen to the next four things because when God gives us instructions and, he, and when he has promised to lead us by specific instructions, it is another way or another way of saying it is that we have come to another season of fours. Another season of fours, okay? How many people remember that there was a time um, I think mid-2020 that I declared to us that we were coming to a season of fours, that several things were coming out and coming at us in fours. Anybody remembers that? Praise the Lord. And then the Lord started coming at us, fours. Almost everything was coming in fours. So there are four things that I want you to listen to very quickly. Two of them I've said already in weeks past and I'm bringing you a quick word of remembrance. We have come to a full year of moving forward. Alrighty, we have come into a full year of what? Of moving forward. I said that before. And then again, the Lord said to us that we should look at Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 19. And what was there? That we should go forth and go toward the gates of the people and stand when we get to the gate. So it is important for us to know that we are moving and it is equally important for us to know that God will have us go forth and stand. Why do we go forth and stand? Because we are not just moving on our own, we are being led by the Lord. Let me help you with um, a little bit of history because quite often when we hear of something that has happened in the past, we are able to better relate with it and then apply it into our own future. Alan, I don't want you to miss much, so can you please help me with a cup of coffee in the meantime? Because I'm about to tell a story that you've heard before. And I hope that we all have heard this story before about the children of Israel when the Lord brought them out with his strong arm, with an outstretched arm, the Lord brought them out of Egypt. You see, God... They, Moses was watching God every step of the way. He was really watching God. And it's like, man, there's a way he does things. And that's why the Bible says that Moses knew the ways of God. And one of the things that Moses recognized, he declared toward the end of his ministry in the book of Deuteronomy. He said, ascribe greatness to our Lord, the rock. Let me tell you something. When I caught that revelation, I felt really small. It humbled me. One of the very first things that Moses would talk about or that he would spell out in his description of the ways of God was that God was a rock. God is immovable. You can't move him. God is a rock. He said, ascribe greatness to our Lord, the rock. He said, his work is perfect and all his ways are just. God bless you, sir. Thank you. He says, his work is perfect. The coffees are hot and all his ways are just. Let me tell you something. God is so just that he would not even break his own principle. And God, he's not going to bring a sword to a fist fight. But if he wants to fight with a sword, he will wait until you go to the next level and then he'll meet you there. God wanted to rescue the children of Israel in such a way that we will talk about it forever. Remember that Moses was essentially a member of Pharaoh's family. He was raised in the palace. When he showed up, it could have just been a family meeting. I said, I know that I did wrong. I went away all those years, but it's over now. It's been 40 years, you know, so let's, let's make this thing happen. And I'm not the same man who left. My rod can turn into a serpent right now, and you've seen it. So why don't you just let my people go? Do you know that the entire experience was almost going in that direction where Pharaoh was actually beginning to consider letting them go? into the wilderness. And Pharaoh was like, it's okay, you can go like three days journey, it's all right. We'll, we'll wait here for you. 
But how would we have seen the outstretched arm of God? When God saw that just showing up and speaking with authority and doing a little miracle here and there, Pharaoh was about to budge. God was like, no, this guy is about to ruin the show. There are still people waiting. Where, what, what do you call those things? If you're going to watch a boxing match and people haven't gotten in yet, they're still right on the bleachers. They're still in the foyer. Buying tickets to come in. So why would you end the context in round one? What's the fun in that? And so God was like, no, 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 no. This one blow is about to knock Pharaoh out. I can't have that. So the Lord said that I may bring out my outstretched arm. I will harden the heart of Pharaoh. Hmm. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh because he is such a just God. He's like, it's unfair for me, the Almighty to fight Pharaoh while he's being gentle and easy going. So what do I need to do? To justify bringing out my outstretched arm. So basically God is saying that on a good day, I can get a lot of things done with my hands in my pocket. But that's not fun. I want some fun. I want to bring out my outstretched arm. So let me harden the heart of Pharaoh. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh and he can do that. That is fair game because the Bible says that the heart of kings are in the hands of the Lord. And like the course of a river, he changes it wherever he wishes. So that was in no violation of kingdom principles. He says, that's what, that, that's what I do. And so he did that and after having hardened the heart of Pharaoh, at that particular point in time, Pharaoh could have chosen to humble himself before the Lord. But he fell for it. When the Lord hardened his heart, he decided to play the game. So as soon as he raised the stakes, God was like, that is exactly what I wanted you to do. You see, the justness of God is such that no matter how you slice and dice it, you will always find him to be true. David said something in Psalms 51 along those lines. He says, against you alone have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found blameless when you judge and just when you speak. David was like, now I see what's going on in here. The reason why such an opportunity for error came along my way was so that you can speak of your mercy because if I hadn't fallen, I wouldn't have recognized the need for that mercy. He says, so you're doing all of these things because you want to show me another dimension of you. God would allow for you to be in a time of need so that he can show you that he is the provider. God would allow Satan to bring all his guns at you so that you can know that your heavenly father is a man of war. <laughs> you know, last on Saturday, we started talking about rejoicing in tribulations. Glorying in tribulations because we know that every opposition that we face becomes an opportunity to experience a new dimension of God's potent power that is operable in the life of a man. So God says, I want to bless you, but if I just bless you, why you've only gone through the same thing that everybody else is going through? How does that make me fair? Job was going to be the richest man in the east and so he had to be the most troubled man from the west. <laughs> you didn't hear what I said. <laughs> Let me tell you something. In the time of Job, most of the problem that people had came from the east, but he had a totally different kind of problem. And that was what made him distinct from the rest. And so Moses had come to recognize that. So he said, ascribe greatness to our Lord the rock. His work is perfect and all his ways are just. Let me tell you something. There are no accidents that happen while God is in control. 
No accidents happen. Everything happens for a reason and that reason is always for his glory. The Bible says he created all things for his pleasure. They are and were created. That is the reason why all glory, honor and power belongs to him. He does everything for his glory and for him to have an opportunity to bring all of his power to bear. So I want you to begin to apply that into your heart and apply that to situations and circumstances that you have gone through that seemed to have put you at a disadvantage and begin to recognize that God is working out a way to show himself. Let me tell you something. The closest you will ever be to God at times <laughs> is when you are the furthest you are from people. When people abandon you and desert you and that seems like a disadvantage it is essentially God saying I want you all to myself ha. let me tell you something I know that some of you all here haven't heard the story but I'm going to tell you if you want to tell the gentleman outside to come in just encourage them to come in because I don't want them to miss this part you see let me say this just encourage them quickly because I don't want you to miss it out either. So don't go there and be preaching the gospel. Just tell them and come back in. Several years ago, I told you the story before. I was the life of the party when I was in my first year. Going into my second year at the university, I was the life of the party. People wanted to invite me to come and hang out with them. And I was a little generous too, so you know how that works. And so people would invite me, hey, you want to hang out? You want to hang out? And I was always there hanging out. And then after a while, I'll be hanging out with people telling stories. And suddenly, I would feel like someone is waiting for me at home. The first time it happened, I left very quickly. I was like, guys, I'll see you later. I need to go. What's going on? I said, I need to go. And so I left and I got to my room because I was staying off campus. And when I got to my room, there was nobody. And I was like, okay why did I have this feeling it happened again and again and again until a while came and I recognized that wait a minute every time I leave those people to come in here I find myself laughing in the spirit like someone is tickling me and the Holy Spirit said to me very audibly he says yes because I am and you know what he said to me he said sit down let me show you exactly what I am doing and he showed to me the people that I was hanging out with he said what do you see I said to him, I see men made in your image and in your likeness. He says, let me show you another picture. He showed me a throne. He says, that is my seat in your heart. He said, and look at the shape of that throne. What are these people? My image and likeness. He said, does any one of them fit that shape? I said, they all do. He said, that is exactly what happens. He says, the more you spend time with people, the more they occupy that space in your heart and you don't feel the need for me. God made man in his image and in his likeness. Quite often, if you spend, while you're spending time with people, they can encourage you. They can lift you up. Some of them can even give you a little bit of change. They can provide and meet some need. And so quite often, if care is not taken, you continue to settle for what man can bring. And because God says, I am a jealous God, he's not going to compete with people in your life. He's only going to offer you an opportunity to recognize that to be with them is to be absent from the Lord. Paul said it this way. He said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When we are too present with people at times, it means that we are too absent from God. The moment he showed me that, it changed my world forever. I will still hang out with my friends, but this time around, I'm the one that is pinging God. Say, are you home already? I did not wait for that feeling of somebody waiting for me. I was the one longing to have him say, now you leave. And then it became a custom amongst, it became customary for me to just hang out for a little bit and disappear. And then after a while, I'll skip a day of not hanging out. I'll skip two days. After a while, I started skipping a whole week of not hanging out. And guess what? Every time I showed up, people then would have missed me so that I enjoyed their company better. 
and they enjoyed mine. But the secret that I'm sharing with you today and the principle that I am sharing with you is that everything God made in a way is a reflection of himself. And so the more time you spend with people and with things, the more you feel content within yourself because a little bit of God has come into your heart. But then if you are always getting that little bit, when are you going to get the whole big God? So I want to encourage you folks, do an inventory of the ones who are sitting on the throne of your heart. You know, today we're going to continue talking about what it means or how we can climb that mountain. There is something that I am preparing us for here. You know, I told you, I'll tell you four things, but I've told you two already. Thing number one, we're going forward. Thing number two is what? Thing number two is that we need to incline our ears to what God is saying because he's leading us moment by moment with a different instruction every single time. Now, I didn't forget where I was. So let me connect you back to where I detoured. I detoured talking about Moses recognizing that the ways of God are just. He says, ascribe greatness to our Lord the rock. His work is perfect and all his ways are what? They are just. One of the things that Moses recognized and one of the things that he came to realize was that God would not expect them to move in a direction that himself is not going. And that was the reason why he said, Lord, we are not moving unless we have seen your glory in the direction that you are leading. Don't worry, all of these things are coming together in just a moment. Let me quickly say this. Come with me to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19. And we're going to quickly look at something in verse 4 and verse 7. Revelation 19, 4. Let me put my marker in this. Psalms 107. Now look at what Revelation 19, 4 says. In fact, let me do you a favor. Let's read verse 7 first. It says, Let us be glad and rejoice. And give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Now verse 4. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. God is sitting on the throne. The bride is making herself ready. Let me tell you something. When you find yourself in a situation wherein you are being asked to wait on God, how do you wait on God? By just standing? No. To wait on God is to make ready. When you go to a restaurant and a waiter is waiting on you, that waiter is not just standing there. Because if that waiter stands there while you are sitting on the throne, nothing happens. There is no food. All of the provision is just wherever it is, nobody to bring it. And so what does the waiter do? The waiter keeps going and coming, going and coming, making everything ready while you are seated. You're seated because you are the one being served. But the waiter is making everything ready because the waiter is the one serving. So when the Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, is because God recognizes that he is not moving from where he's at. You are the one going to make everything ready. So your strength needs to constantly be renewed because God will not but be served. See, let me tell you something, folks. When God wants something, he doesn't expect you to guess. He says something. He speaks to us. So every time we are with him, we receive an instruction. And once we act on that instruction, the angels minister to us as we return back to him for the next instruction. 
The way God wants to lead us in this season is such that whenever we leave his presence to go minister to somebody else in his name, we should minister and return to him as opposed to pitching a tent with men because they have nothing to replenish you with. You see, because what I want to show us in Psalms 107 requires for us to understand the basic principle of going and coming before the Lord. You see, going and coming before the Lord requires re you recognizing the one who should be sitting on that throne of your heart. I may go every now and again to go hang out with people, to spend time with friends, to spend time with clients, but I never allow myself to see anybody on that throne other than the master himself. <laughs> Don't worry, we're going somewhere with this. Let me tell you something, folks. This 2023, we need to be frequent in his presence. Otherwise, we will be led astray. Many people who are looking to exalt their throne above where God has put them in your life will do everything possible to make you take instructions from them. Now, Communion House, I speak to you prophetically. Like I told you, the miscreants who are ready to take over, thinking that it is their turn to come into power because God is dethroning rulers, they would want to pitch their thrones and get you to take instructions from them. But if you are not frequent in God's presence, you will not know which instruction to follow. Don't worry, that's going to make sense. But for now, let's go back to Psalms 107. In fact, the Lord will have me show you something here in verse 6. Verse 6 of Revelations 19, what does it say? It says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and the sound of many thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let me explain something that is going on in here. You see, I think I'm going to tell you two more things other than the four that I set out to tell. So here is one of them. The enemy is very crafty. That's why the Bible says, do not be ignorant of the devices of Satan. Part of the cunning craftiness of Satan is to allow for you to find in people that which you should be seeking in God. It's part of his craftiness to allow for you to find in things and in people what you should be seeking in God. Have you ever wondered the reason why you and I want to know what people are saying? Like, what are they saying about the stock market? What are they saying about crypto? What are they saying about the housing market? What are they saying? Do you know why? I, for a long time, I didn't really know why until the Lord brought me to Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. And he showed to me, he said, because the voice of the Lord is like thunder upon many waters. The voice of God is like the sound of the multitude. Let me say that again because I don't want you to miss it. You see, your spirit recognizes that the voice of God is like the sound of a multitude. When God speaks... It sounds like what, when, when John the Beloved heard Jesus, he says, the voice of my Lord sounded like thunder upon many waters. Your spirit recognizes that when God speaks, it's like thunder upon many waters. When his praises are declared in his presence, he sounds like the voice of a multitude. And that is the reason why you are always looking to find what the multitude is saying because there's a similitude in the acoustic of the voice of the crowd and the voice of the throne. Huh. But you know how you can determine which one is the voice of the people? And which one is the voice of God? No, 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 no. You see, there is a particular temple. I had to learn this thing. I sat down and let the Lord teach me. There is a temple that the voice of the throne makes. And it's this. Very simple. You just read it. It gives all the glory to God. 
if you hear any opinion that does not say that God reigns, it's the multitude. You read it here. He says they were saying the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Sometimes it takes knowing the nuances to not fall for the trappings, the trappings of Satan. And the Bible says that God expects for that to be your responsibility. The Bible says you do not the ignorant of the devices of the crafty. So it is my duty to know exactly how the enemy operates. And if I don't, and if I'm struggling, what do I do? I ask the one who knows and he will tell me and break it down to me. So when the multitude is speaking and they are not giving glory to God, that he is the one who reigns and that he is the all powerful. If there is anything that is being said that spells impossibility, it is the voice of the multitude because the voice of God is always saying with him, all things are possible. So let me tell you what's about to happen. You know that there are angels on the earth now, some of whom have never been on the earth because they are helping the bride to prepare for the Lord. And because of the presence of angels here, there are messages that have been sent that your spirit is willing and eager to respond to, but because of the lack of of the renewal of mind, the messages are lost in the works. By the time it gets to your consciousness, it sounds like you need to listen to the multitude. I'm gonna explain that very quickly because I'm speaking to you in pictures. So let me help you understanding a little better. You see, your spirit knows exactly what God sounds like, what the instructions of the angels sound like, the angels who are declaring his glory. Your spirit knows because your spirit is in Christ in God at the right hand of the Father. Your spirit is not an alien to the presence of God. Because when the Bible says in him we live and move and have our being, he wasn't talking about these two legs that walk around the mall of Georgia looking for things to buy that you do not need. Because that part of you is not in God. That is your physical body is just walking around the street. So the part of you that lives and moves, the part of you that is seated at the right hand of the Father is your spirit. And the Bible says what part of a man knows the things of that man? The spirit of the man. Just like the Holy Spirit knows the things of God. So your spirit knows, but by the time your spirit is trying to communicate through your subconscious to your consciousness what to expect in the natural, it sounds like, oh, the spirit is saying that we should listen to the multitude. And that is why we need the renewal of mind, otherwise we will be conformed unto this world. In order for you not to continue to misinterpret what the Spirit is saying, guess what? You need a constant renewal of mind, particularly in the times that we are in because there is a lot of amplitude in the realm of the Spirit. What do I mean by a lot of amplitude? Things that used to sound faint in the Spirit are now sounding very audible. And the louder a thing is, is not the clearer it is. You know how people say that actions speak louder than words. Do you know that's true? But words will always speak clearer. Maybe not louder, but clearer. So the fact that there is an increase in amplitude in signals coming out of the realm of the spirit because of the angels that are boots on the ground in the season that we're in and also because the earth itself has been activated. The earth is like an introvert. It doesn't speak very much but the Bible says that in the last days it will begin to groan because it's been, it's been in pain for too long. So the implication of the amplification of the voice of the earth and the voice of angels is also that it is being mimicked by the kingdom of darkness and that is the reason why the media exists to bombard you with everything that's on the mind of Satan. We need to understand the time that we're in simply because it has never been more critical for us to be able to decipher what the Lord is saying because in this season, God is leading us by what we hear and not what we see. So when God says in 2023, I want you guys to keep advancing, keep moving forward. 
He says, but you're not just going to take one instruction from me and go. Because if your waiter receives the instruction of what you want and goes and never returns, all you might have for the night might just be a cup of iced tea. Because you ordered your drink, but the waiter never came back to hear your appetizer. Your waiter never waited to hear what you wanted for your entree. And so guess what happens? The waiter listens to one instruction and goes away. He is worn out because he's not back for renewal and you are left unsatisfied because your waiter is not delivering. And that's why the Lord is saying, this year, this new season, I need you to know how to separate yourself from the crowd, how to divorce yourself from the influence of mammon, so that something in you is always crying for the sustenance that is in me, for you to keep coming back, because when you come back, you feed me and I feed you. Because the Lord said to us about three weeks ago, that at every gate, we need an instruction. I said all the six things already. So it's for you to go and listen again and then piece it out. All right? Because my wife told me, she was like, why must you always try to summarize everything? Because then you just repeat yourself. I said, okay. I'm going to let people go extract their own summary later. But when I told you I was going to say those things, I already said it. It's just that I had to say it together so that it doesn't seem convoluted. But now I believe that I have prepared your heart for Psalms 107 verse 7. Psalms 107 verse 7, what does it say? We're, when we read it the first time, the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, let the singers sit down, let the people sit down. He said, because the way you want to say it, no one's going to get it. But now, by the grace of God, we're ready to get it. So Psalms 107 verse 7. He says, and he led them forth by the right way, that they may go to a city for a dwelling place. The inheritance, the promise of God for you and I is that we will inherit our dwelling place. So when the Lord is saying that I'm going to lead them the right way, he is advancing the instruction that he gave to us at the beginning of the year that we should go forth, but that we should wait at every gate for what else he has to say. The Bible says it would lead us, we will go forth because it will lead us the right way. So let me talk about leading the right way for a moment. There was something that I said earlier and I want to borrow that. The kingdom of darkness, they've also mustered all of their arsenal to this dimension. So this is where it's at right now. Everybody's here. You know, I've been saying it for like two years. Everybody is here. I am begging you for Christ's sake. If you have never heard God, if you've never participated, nor engaged in the things of the spirit, this is the time to do it because it's never been easier. Ask the seers that you know, it has never been easier to see into the realm of the spirit. You just have to want it. You just have to desire it. You just have to pick up your Bible to study. I've asked, I've taken polls again and again here that the Bible is more, uh, what's the word now? Is more easily comprehensible in the season that we're in than any other season prior. Simply because it's, it's come to life because every, everything has come to this point. We have come to the zero hour of power. Everything is here. Hmm. Let me remind you of something that I said in 2021. Because I want you to recognize that everything is here has several implications. And you are not supposed to be a bystander nor an onlooker. You are supposed to be participating in what God and heaven are doing on the earth. Let me tell you the reason why you have to volunteer to participate. Number one, the Bible says in the days of the Lord's power, the people shall be willing. Another translation says, in the days of heaven's power, the people shall be volunteers. Don't worry, please stay focused. Let's all come together here because I don't want you to miss this. What is the day of the Lord's power? Moses said, our Lord is the rock. The angels declare his praises that he's the omnipotent God, omnipotent. 
with him all things are possible. He is the rock, whoever hits him gets broken. Whoever he hits, he grinds into powder. He said, but his ways are just. So with all that power that he has, he's only going to bring his power when power is required. Okay, there you go. He would only bring his power when power is required. So let us apply that to the equation that I stated earlier on that the Bible says that in the day that God brings his power, the people shall be volunteers. The Holy Spirit said to me, he said, it is more like the people should be volunteers. And I'll explain what that means. The people who have been following the instructions of God will know that the natural thing for them to do is to volunteer to participate in whatever God wants to do with that power. Because we know that he doesn't always just bring his power. When he brings his power because he is just, is because that power is required. I gave you an incident, an instance in the Old Testament when God brought his power. Why did he bring his power? Because Pharaoh was being difficult. Even though he was the one who had in his heart. Let's put that aside. But Pharaoh was being difficult. Do you know what Pharaoh did? In order for Pharaoh to stop the children of Israel from going, Pharaoh went to incite all of the gods of Egypt. And there were 10 of them. And that was the reason why God brought the 10 plagues. Because each one of those plagues was to defeat each one of those gods. I've already told you before, all of the gods they worshipped, the frog, the blood, everything, even the sun. That was why darkness came. Darkness came because of Ra. Because all of their gods that they were worshipping, God defeated them one by one. And Pharaoh was not involved in his gods initially because he thought he was just himself and his old cousin. But God was like, no, I don't want to fight you. That's not going to be fair. You are a man. I am God. But you have made for yourself gods. It's a God kind of fight. And that was the reason why God says, I'm not going to bring out my arm against a man. That is not fair. But when those gods come, I can then stretch forth my hands, stretch it out because now it's a fair battle. We're fighting in the heavens. And we will see the result on the earth. That is one instant. instance. When you look at all the instances in the Bible where God brought his guns is because he got challenged. Remember Elisha and Gehazi. Elisha was a prophet, an old man. Gehazi was a confused man who had so much opportunity but did not know what to do with it. Like several of us. Now why would you bring against those two people a man and a half? Two and a half. Because Elisha was essentially two people in one. I think Anne got it. <laughs> it's a story for another day, but if you want to look into it, when John the Baptist was asked if he was Elisha, he said he wasn't. Because Elisha, is, if, if he was Elijah, he said he wasn't. Because Elisha was essentially two people. Because when Elijah was going, he says, if you see me when I leave, you will get two double portions. And so the man was able to operate in two dimensions. Okay, so maybe that's where they got the name two and a half men. Because Elisha was two people, but Gehazi was half a man. What do you mean by half a man? Gehazi was already complete in his assignment by serving the men of God, but all through his life, he felt like he always needed something. He felt incomplete all his life. And that was the reason why when somebody offers money, he wanted it. When somebody offered an opportunity that had nothing to do with him, he wanted to volunteer simply because he never felt complete in himself. Many of us are like that. We're supposed to be complete in Christ Jesus, but we're seeking things that we do not need. We seek validation. You know, Paul said something when people were bad mouth. You know, people were talking about Paul. They said he was not a real apostle. They talked about Paul. They said he was a licentious person that he was encouraging people to go around uncircumcised. Paul was not regarded by people in his day. Let me tell you something. You see us now, we're reading all the New Testament and all the epistles and we're celebrating Paul. In his days, people rubbished him. In fact, there were times when Peter did not want to identify with him. But you know what Paul said? After a while, he was like, I am done trying to make people like me. He says, I have a revelation. I am accepted in the beloved. 
let me tell you something no man can make you complete no accolades can make you complete you can only be complete when you have a revelation that you are complete in Christ Jesus oh there you go thank you baby oh yeah so he says I am accepted in the beloved because if you people don't want to accept me it is you that is at a loss you don't know who I am because if you know who I am, then you would accept me because I am a gift from God to the body. So if you don't accept me, shame on you. But I know that I am accepted in the beloved. That was what he said. And that is the truth. And so at the end of the day, you look at two and a half men and then you bring the entire army of Syria against them. God was waiting for Syria to make that mistake of bringing their entire army. You bring your entire army against two and a half men, God was like, ha, this is awesome. He just decided to call a battalion of angels. Because you know that he's the God of the army of angels. All the angels answer to him. That's why they call him Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. God would not have done that if they hadn't brought all the armies of Syria. But they brought all the armies of Syria. He brought his power. Look at what happened to the, to the apostles. After Jesus was raised from the dead, they were like fugitives hiding because the entire nation was looking for them to make sure that they do not continue to preach Christ crucified and resurrected. And because of all the opposition, they were hiding all in the upper room. Nobody could really go anywhere. In fact, do you know that the Bible says that of the people who were there on the day, there were only 120 because they had a register of about 550 or so people who were awaiting the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, but only 120 could make it there on the day. The opposition was so much, and so what did God do? God brought the power. In Acts chapter four, they forbade them from using the name of Jesus, and guess what happened? God brought the power. God only brings the power when it is required. I'm gonna wrap it up in a minute because I see Natalie's on the edge of her seat. I tell you what, I, 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 see, I said it and then she got up. Praise the Lord. God bless you, sis. So at the end of the day, before somebody else leaves, let's wrap it up. When the Lord says, in the day of my power, the people shall be volunteers. God is saying, if you do not volunteer to come and serve with me in the day that I bring my power, Satan will recruit you into his army. So the reason why we need to learn how to pay attention to what God is saying is because Satan is always is also at the same time dishing out instructions. So the only way by which we will continue to be led the right way is to continue to pay attention to what God is saying. And how do you pay attention to what God is saying? David says, I will incline my ears to him and how do you incline your ears to him I can't incline my ears to Charles where is that to incline your ear means to move close and to lean in that is what a waiter does and so if we will be led aright by the Lord in these times that we're in we need to develop the culture of separating ourselves from the crowd and aligning ourselves ourselves with God because we also need to hear his voice and the multitude of angels that are speaking it is because of the times that we're in let me say this I started saying it but I didn't finish let me finish painting this picture for you the fact that we have angels here in numbers that we've never seen before. The fact that the host of heaven is present here is indicative of the fact that the enemy was the first to assemble his army. The army of demons. The army of what? Of, of, of what do you call that spirit? The army of demons that are led by the reprobate spirit is on the earth. You don't need anybody to tell you, you already know. If you look at the spate of immorality and wickedness and deception that is in the world, it tells you one thing, they are here and they're perpetrating their evil. And that is the reason why the Lord says it is now okay for his angels to be boots on the ground. God doesn't just bring his power if there is no opposition. 
the opposition is here but the power of the Lord is also here but let me tell you something about the opposition the opposition that we are fighting against they were trained in the courts of heaven because they used to serve in the army of God because you know Satan pulled a third of the stars in the heaven and the Bible says the dragon having pulled a third of the stars in the heaven was spewing water out of its mouth after the woman and her child and her children who were in the wilderness the woman and her children refers to the body of Christ because Jesus was the first son that the woman had that was called up to heaven. Revelation chapter 12. If you're not familiar with the story, please get yourself familiar with it. It is the, it's one of the, it's one of the most, okay, maybe we can stop distributing that thing. I don't want people to be too distracted. Thank you, Alan. See, recognizing your place in Revelation 12 allows for you to know exactly what to do in the times that we're in. So the third of the angels, those stars that were pulled by the dragon, they were the angels that fell from heaven. So they know exactly the order of heaven. And that is the reason why they can easily trick your heart because they know that you were made for his presence. You were made for his instructions. And the Bible is not even keeping us in the dark. God said to us, he said, be mindful because Satan in the last days will come with his angels and they look like angels of light. He says they will come at you like angels of light. Satan will come and his messengers too because they know how to fake light because they were of the light. Satan's original name was called Lucifer, the light bearer. And those angels that fell, God calls them stars. So there is so much closeness in their approach and in the approach of the angels who are on your side. So you must sharpen your discernment, otherwise you will be marching in the wrong army and still be feeling good with yourself. And that is the reason why it was called the great deception. Because people are deceived and did not, they did not even know. And it's happening again. Do you know how many people now who think they are fighting on the Lord's side who are literally fighting against God? Jesus said, as it, as it was in my day, so shall it be in your day. He said, what they did to me, they will do to you. And in the time of Jesus, the people who killed Jesus thought they were doing God a favor. The ones who crucified him, they crucified him because they said he was blasphemous. They crucified him because they said he was doing too much. They crucified him because they thought they were fighting for God. What they did not know was that they were marching to the beats of the horde of hell. And the same thing is happening again. And so the Lord is saying, if I am going to lead you to go forth, the only way to lead you is to lead you in the right way because my ways are just, but you need that instruction per time because that's how we're going to beat them. Because if he gives you all the instruction, you know what you're going to do? You know what God has experienced with us? When he gives us all the instruction, we modify it. We interpret it the way we want. After a while, you don't remember the last, the fourth thing. And you're like, do you remember the fourth thing that God said? And the other person is like, I don't, but I think it's this. And both of you just make something up and then you go with it. And God is like, I don't want you going with your own instructions. I want you to come so that it's fresh every time. You and I can no longer be strangers to the presence of God. Now I'm going to attempt to summarize without repreaching the message. You see, not, not the full summary, okay baby, just a little. I knew the day I said I was going to continue or I might continue telling you more about how to climb that slippery mountain. But there is no point climbing if you don't know why you're climbing. On Saturday, I told you the dividends of going up to the mountain. But in addition to knowing the dividends of going the mountain, you must also know the routine of going up and coming down, going up and coming down, because what it means to wait on him is to go up to the mountain, receive instructions, and come and deliver it and perform a wonder on the, on the ground and go back. That was what Moses was doing. That was what Joshua was doing. That was what Jesus did every day of his ministry. He went up to the mountain at night and in the daytime he came to the ground to walk the signs and wonders for, because he said, without signs and wonders, they will not believe. And so you and I need to know, not just how to climb the mountain, 
but how to go up and down and to know how you first of all need to know why because knowledge must not precede wisdom when knowledge precedes wisdom what happens people become pompous and proud the Bible says knowledge puffs up but love edifies what is knowledge it, what answers the question what what is wisdom what answers the question why I was about to get into it and the Holy Spirit said to me he says no they need to know why because wisdom is what answers the question why why do I need to know how to go up that mountain why am I even going up oh yes the Lord lives on the mountains that's great but then I can just go there and stay with him forever no he wants me to go and come go and come going and coming is the gospel of moderation you need to know how to come and minister to people here a little, there a little, and then return to the presence of God for replenishing. Because if you don't go back to the presence of God for replenishing, you will start preaching your own gospel to people. People have a way of drawing things from you continually. We see men today who in the 80s were preaching the word of God undiluted. They were preaching the gospel of the kingdom with all zest and all clarity. But because they failed to go back again and again to be replenished, after a while, because men were placing a demand on them, they started to manufacture their own word. Jesus was tempted to do the same. He says, no. He says, I only say the things that I have heard of my father. You can't make me say what I haven't heard. When the people were pulling on him too much, he was like, I'll be right back. He disappeared to the mountains. He would do that again and again because these people, they know how to make you feel like you're the Lord of the Rings. Oh, people would tell you that, Pastor, that message you preached on Saturday, I died and I got resurrected when I listened to that message. People would say, you know what? I did not even know how to open the door of my house until I came across your ministry. Man of God, the Lord is with you. And before you know what's going on, you start to examine yourself and say, wow, <laughs> Woo, I'm the man. No, you're not. That's Satan. <laughs> you see, my brother had a revelation once before. He said to me, he said, do you know the reason why Satan became full of himself? He said, because he was the cherubim. The Bible says he was that anointed cherub whose wings covered the glory around the throne. So because he was always around the throne, God was here and God was being praised. Some of the praise was hitting him and he thought he was the one being magnified. Oh yeah. And you know what that is like? It's like the donkey thinking that people were throwing their garments for it. So just imagine if that donkey suddenly was like, Jesus, get off my back. Can't you see? People are celebrating me. Then he will realize very quickly, anybody care about you, donkey? You are just an ass. I'm speaking British English because that's what a donkey is. What makes you a real, the real deal is the one that you carry. You see what I mean? And so we need to recognize that people, people, do you know that people wanted to make Jesus king? They were planning and many of them at the same time were thinking the same thing. Mass media, it's easy to make everybody think the same thing. Do you know that they didn't say it? The Bible says they reasoned among themselves that now they will make him king. And the Bible says when Jesus heard what was in their heart, he decided to put away the crowd. He scared them off by telling them to come and drink blood. Everybody ran. They're like, this guy is a blasphemer. We need to crucify him, not make him king. But I tell you that because I want you to recognize one thing, at least one thing, that in the times that we are in, we need to recognize that going and coming is what it means to wait on the Lord. And it's only the ones who wait on the Lord that will become renewed and able to mount up with wings as an eagle. God does not expect you to be struggling and sliding and slipping and falling off the side of this slippery mountain. He wants you to soar like an eagle. And that is only going to happen when you understand the principle of waiting on the Lord. Go to the Lord, hear what he says. Come to the gates of the people. Jeremiah 17, 19. What does it say? God says, I want you to go to the gates where my people are and then stand. You see, God is not expecting you to go there and sit. To sit 
means to settle yourself there. No, I'm standing as a waiter. You know how disgusted you will be if your waiter is also sitting and staring at you in the face? So who's serving who? He says, no, go there and stand and await the next instruction. Communion house, people of God, this is the season for sharpening our discernment. Let me quickly give you two things for sharpening your discernment. Thing number one is you need to learn how to doubt yourself so that you can believe God. You didn't hear me. You see, let me tell you something. Your natural self is primarily responsive, responsive to its senses and emotions. Your emotions will suggest things to you based on your composition. Look at the 10 spies. They said, we look like grass. They said, we are like grasshopper in their sights. Why? Because the, the emotion of fear was speaking to them for their, from their physical composition. They were literally human size against the Nephilim that were in Jericho. You know the people who lived in Jericho, they were giants. Their walls were so thick, people lived in the wall. Rahab was living in the wall. Now, how big is the wall in your house? Your human-sized wall is probably about six inches. But these people, their walls were so thick that people actually had condominiums in the wall. The little people who served them, but the ones who lived in the heart of Jericho were giants. And so when they went on the wall and they saw those giants, they ran back very quickly. <laughs> I said, you know, forget it. We're not possessing nothing. That is because they were listening to their emotions. The reason why you need to doubt yourself so that you can believe in God is you need to come to accept that it is not you that will do it, but God. You see, because if you think that you are the one that will do it, every assignment God gives to you will intimidate you out of your mind. Because God does not call any one of us to do things that we can do by ourselves. He calls us to do things that he can do through us. So to sharpen your discernment is to learn how to play down your emotions. Whenever you feel afraid, tell yourself, why are you afraid? Can then, is there anything that you can do? No, God does it all. Put yourself in its place and then God will come on the throne. Thing number one. Thing number two, I already told you again and again. Joshua chapter one verse eight. Meditate on the word of God. Get yourself familiar with the word of God. Speak that word of God. Know what it sounds like so that when the enemy comes and they're trying to put if where God has not put an if. When the devil is coming to put a question mark when God has put a period. You know, if I say that your name is, jo your name is Matthew, that is a statement. But Satan will come and say, your name is Matthew? You see what I mean? But God says your name is Matthew. If you keep putting a question mark where God has put a period, you will follow the leading of Satan because that is what it does. But how do you know the difference between your name is Matthew and your name is Matthew? By having spoken it enough, what God has said. So when somebody puts an inflection on it, they're like, no, 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 no. That's not what he said. Those two things you needed. I know we'll be meditating on a couple of scriptures, but in order for us to break bread, now please let everybody have the communion and then we're going to break bread. I'm going to just quickly read to us from Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. That is our scripture for breaking bread today. And while Alan is still giving the communion, I'm going to tell us the reason why it is our scripture for today. You see, one of the things that the Lord is making clear is that you've all seen Psalms 107, verse 7. He says, I'm going to lead you the right way so that you can go forth, right? And the way that he's going to lead us is by instruction at every turn that we get to, every juncture that we get to. Gone are the days wherein the Lord will say to you, I want you to go to the house of Matthew and pray for him. And then you will get to the house of Matthew and just begin to pray because the Lord said to go and pray. No, these days when you get to the house of Matthew, you will say, Brother Matthew, the Lord has sent me here to pray. But hold on a second. Let me hear what he wants me to pray. You engage him every step of the way. Now, this scripture, the Lord gave me this scripture as we're breaking bread because of the fact that there is a kind of atmosphere that you need to carry in your heart all the time for you to hear very clearly what God is saying. It is not the amplitude that makes clear what is being said, not the volume. 
what makes clear what is being said is, is the lack of noise. You know, I can be speaking to you through this microphone and you can hear me. But the moment he cranks up his piano or perhaps he starts playing a very loud music, even though I'm still speaking at the same tempo, you don't hear me anymore because there is noise. God is saying, I want you all to learn how to remove noise from your heart so that you can hear me. Many of us truly want to volunteer. We want to be in God's service. We want to do what God is saying, but it's just that we don't hear. We're not clear. We're a little confused. So this is what the Lord is saying to do in this season. So Psalms 103 verse 7. We started meditating on that one and then we went to Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 19 and then we went to which one again? We went to Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, right? And so now this is another one that we will be meditating upon in this season. And it says, finally, brethren, this is the book of Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. It's interesting because Philippians means, Philip means the lover of horses. So you have anybody that loves to really tie into what God is doing in this season and go forth like a horse. You need to pay attention here. He says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are pure. Let's start again. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there is any virtue, if there is what any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy meditate on these things folks as we break bread today i want us to renew our commitment to meditating on the things that are noble the things that are true the things that are pure the things that are of a good report. Let me say this to the people that are politically, a little bit more politically active than I am. In this next election, listen to what your candidate has to say about what they want to do as opposed to what they're saying against the opposition. Let me say this again. Whatever your candidate, the one that you elect to follow, listen to what they have to say about what they will do. The moment they start talking down the opposition, cut it off. Because it is not a noble thing to do. It is not a what? A noble thing to do. Does God come to you telling you bad things about Satan? No. He tells you good things about himself. About himself, he says, I am the Lord, your God, the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I have sworn by myself and I will not relent that I will make your name great, that I will keep your descendants upon the face of the earth, that you will not like a man upon the throne. The Lord tells you the things that he will do. He doesn't spend his time telling you that the devil is not good. If anything at all, he says to you, mind your business. Don't speak evil of dignitaries. In the season that we're in, if we will not march to the beats of Satan and find ourselves serving Satan against God, then we need to make sure that we're guarding the gates of our heart against the things that are not praiseworthy. Now, one thing that we read that I did not explain, which I'm just going to quickly chip in here, is that when God told his people in Jeremiah 17, 19 to go to the gates. Which gate was he talking about? He was talking about the gate where Judah was proceeding from and Judah means praise. Anybody that is talking down the other is not the person you want to listen to. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, pure, of a good report, if there is any virtue, if there's any praise, meditate on these things. If you're listening to the news and all of what they're talking about is robbery at the gas station, murder on the streets, just go from there. Because those things are not of a good report. Shield your heart from those things. You know why? You know, I told you that I've seen the angels and the Lord's also given me an insight into the hordes of hell. What you have is what you give. Satan and his angels have been so disconnected from the presence of God. All they have right now to give is guile, is negativity, is pain, is sorrow, is 
all those things because that's what they have and so when you're hearing those things you know who you're listening to the Lord is speaking Alan and he's speaking expressly he says whether you turn to the left or to the right it is my commitment to make sure that you hear a voice telling you this is the way the Lord will always tell you the way. He said it again. I will lead you the right way. But you must not tolerate noise. Because the noise can corrupt my signal. That is coming into your spirit. And that is the reason why the Lord made me tell you that story of myself. How I had to separate myself from the crowd of the people. And seek him. Because let me tell you something. Some of those people sound just like their, their father who made them. But they're just not saying what their father says. You can have the voice of God, but not speak the word of God. And that has happened multiple, multiple times. A prime example is Peter. Peter spoke by the Holy Spirit. Jesus recognized it, but with the same voice, he started to speak on behalf of Satan. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, O Satan. So it is possible for you to hang out with people who actually sound spiritual. They sound very well calculated when it comes to kingdom principles, but in reality, they're not speaking the heart of God for the now. And so basically they have become Satan in your ears. And the Lord is saying, here a little, there a little. You need to know exactly when to withdraw your step from the house of Potiphar. Alrighty, let's break bread before it becomes two services in one. Or maybe even three. So remember, so I just heard somebody say, just right now. You said, Lord, how exactly do I do that? Let me pray for you, Brother Matthew. Because the thing is, you have just done exactly what the Lord says to do. The Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. But in all your gettings, get understanding. My sister Kamisa, you come too. You see, because you ask the question, how? Because what does, what, what does the question how answer? Or what answers the question how? understanding so you're like okay God this is how you want me to comport myself in this season but how am I going to do that let me show you one thing very quickly I'm not even going to give you I'm kind of kind of lending you Matthew chapter 7 verse 12 it says therefore whatsoever you want men to do to you do also to them the way you will navigate in this season without the voice of negativity producing noises in your heart is for you to speak positive you will speak as though you have come to the gates of Judah find things that are praiseworthy even in people that have been talked down find things that are of virtue even in situations that somewhat have been compromised simply because if you do not lead the charge the enemy will not recognize you as one who is in charge so you have to lead the charge and this goes for every single one of us apply your heart to wisdom ah the lord says to give you one more thing come to this is for everybody matthew chapter 13 verse 2 uh, you see, this thing that I'm about to hand to you is a weapon. Matthew chapter 13 verse 2, look at what it says. The Bible says, and great multitudes were gathered together to him. So he got into a boat and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then listen, the Bible says, then he spoke many things to them in parables. Let me tell you something. God wants you to speak in parables. He wants you to speak what is praiseworthy. When people are saying there's a casting down, you will say that there is a lifting up. But if you say it directly, they will oppose you. But when you say it in the parable, they will sit down and they will listen to you. The power to grab their attention is to speak in parables. What are parables? Parables are divinely inspired methods of delivering the mysteries of God. They will want to oppose you if you were just coming out, oh ha. Because they'd be like, oh, have you also joined them? Are you not one of them too? No, but confuse them with parables. I told you it's a weapon. Let me tell you something, true story. 
a couple of days ago, I went to the Lord. I said, I have an issue with some things that are going on. I talk to people who come to these meetings, who listen to my messages, who listen online. And certain times I'm talking to people, I'm cracking jokes, I'm laughing, but what I am doing is I am running tests to see how much of what is in here that the, that the Lord's been inspiring me to communicate that is being retained. I do that a lot because the Lord expects me to do that as a teacher to test to see if the student is retaining. Otherwise, if there's no communication, then we might as well go home. What is the point? So sometimes I'm talking to people, I'm laughing and joking. Some people have come to recognize it more than the others that I'm trying to get to know if you are retaining stuff. And I said to the Lord, I said, I am not happy with the assessment of the people. I said, because there are things that you have shown to me that I have tried to communicate that has not been retained. And the Lord said to me, it's on you. I was like, how is that on me? He said, because Jesus was in the same situation that you were in. The one who has been in eternity. He came to the earth and he was talking to people 2,000 years ago who did not even know the meaning of zeros and ones. They didn't understand binary. They didn't understand the science and the physics that you know now. So how are they able to understand the mysteries of heaven? Because the Bible says it is through understanding the physical elements of this world that we have an understanding of the invisible attributes of God. They did not know what you knew and Jesus, who knows more than you do, had to communicate with them. The Holy Spirit said to me that Jesus overcame his challenge. And it's on you to overcome yours by learning from the best. And the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, you just need more parables. This was about maybe four or five days ago. We had this conversation. I stood in the mirror because I was dissatisfied. And so I needed to have my, my eyes on the issue. And the Lord said to me, well, you know what to do. So I am sharing with you what has been revealed to me to be a weapon for cracking the code. And that is to make a commitment to speak the truth, that which is pure. And then to also seek the Lord to give you parables to deliver it. Let us break bread. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for the body of the Lord Jesus that was broken for us. Father, we thank you for the blood of the Lamb that was slain even before the foundations of the earth. Thank you, Lord, because you have given us all of the things that pertain to life and godliness so that we can be complete, lacking nothing. And so as we partake of the body of Jesus today and drink of his blood, let our hearts be made whole again in divine revelation and understanding of truths that you have called mysteries. Hey, kunda hunda, is zom kunda hunda, she zom kunda hunda, lekum skiyama. You know what the Lord said? The Lord says, and you know me, I believe very much in the gifts of the Spirit. And I want to encourage you and challenge you to go up higher. When you speak in tongues, also believe for interpretation. So what I just said, the Lord says, tell them to open the books, to flip the pages, and the book will speak to them. The Lord is saying that you need to just seek and he will speak to you from his word. Jude chapter seven, not Jude, Judges. Uh, don't worry, ma'am, you can go to your seat if you want to, but if you want to stay, you still can. Judges chapter 7 verse 19. Let me tell you something, folks. The book will speak to you. So this is what it says. It says, so Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle of the watch just as they posted the watch and they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. You know, I told you in the beginning, the first set of tongues that I spoke, what did I tell you it meant? I said it was a set of melodies that was supposed to activate the angels that would break, that would blow the trumpets. Okay? The angels that would blow the trumpets. Now, what is the Lord telling us? The Lord says, you have the picture that contains the treasures that you need to share with the people, but don't break the picture until the trumpets have been blown. The Lord is telling us one thing here, folks. He wants his angels to go ahead of you. So as we engage people, we need to enjoy the ministry of angels going ahead of us and making the crooked path straight so that your word, which is the word of the Lord in your mouth, can be delivered. Don't break the picture until you hear the sound of the trumpet. So we started with that tongue and we ended with this one. The Lord is saying he wants to guide your delivery. We are his witnesses, we have treasures that we are carrying and we have to deliver. 
So that is a bonus on the breaking of bread today. In fact, my bread is already soaked in the wine. I'm going to just have it anyway. Let us eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. I'm going to just pray for you and bless you, Emmanuel. As I was having that, I saw that somebody is there who wants to take advantage of you. They don't mean well, but the Lord says when they try to find you, you will not be where they expect you to be. The Lord has chosen to protect you and cloak you from the opposition. You know, there are certain times that we forget that we're at war and we just think everybody's nice and friendly and they're just minding their business. No, there are people who are instruments in the hands of Satan. They will come seeking you, but they will not find you. And the Lord will let you know what he has shielded you from that he may give him glory. So very quickly, we're going to have the offering instructions and we're going to have the announcements. I want to encourage you, please don't be in a hurry. Watch all the instruction slides and also prepare to give your offering. And I'm going to just bless the offering in advance. Father, in Jesus' name. Okay, all righty. The offerings, you bring them into the offering bowl. Once they get here, um, someone else is going to bless them. For the rest of us, can I get your attention one minute? Very quickly. Um, I want you all to read Matthew chapter 19 ahead of the next meeting. All righty, read Matthew chapter 19 ahead of the next meeting. Focus on verse 7. Let the Lord speak to you. I'm going to get you started. I'm going to tell you one thing. And you can listen as you're preparing your offering. But please don't be in a hurry to get out of here because there are so many announcements. The women's conference is coming up. Um, we're also having a cookout, right? Can I say that? Oh, yeah. What, what day is it again? The 16th, which is a Sunday. 16th, 16th of, of, of October. We're having a cookout at our house. Anybody miss the house just yet? Praise the Lord. So we're having a cookout at the house. The weather is going to be phenomenal. It's going to be great. So what I want you to do is start, just get yourself familiar with all of Matthew 19. Some of you may have to start from Matthew chapter 1, okay? Because if you just jump right into Matthew 19, you know what's going to happen to you. So you might need to start from the beginning, but read Matthew 19. Verse 7 is where I want to show you a little bit of, see, let me tell you what I want to do. Because the Lord said to me to paint the picture so your spirit can know what's about to happen. There is a calibrator in your heart that allows your heart to be in sync with the frequency of what God is saying now. And you need to know how to calibrate so that you are in sync with his frequency. The Bible says Jesus is the good shepherd and his sheep know his voice. So now look at what he says, verse 7. Of Matthew chapter 19. He says, And they said to him, Why did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce to put her away? They were asking Jesus why Moses allowed people to divorce their wives. Right? And this is what Jesus responded with. Jesus said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of their hearts, permitted them to divorce their wives but from the beginning it was not so I want you to meditate on all of to read all of 19 but you see verse 7 pointed something out a lot of us were asking the Lord questions because we're hoping for answers that would allow for us to remain as we are and the Lord is saying it is the hardness of heart it is the deceitfulness of the hearts of men so I want you to meditate and wash yourself with the word of God and say, Father, let your word, your word wash me of every desire to remain as I am. Wherever my heart is hardened against your word, soften my heart. Because if you do not repent like that before the Lord, guess what? The word of God will not have its way. So I want to encourage you. Do not be like these guys. So when you read it, say, Lord, I'm not asking out of the hardness of heart to remain as I am. I want you to take me back to as it was in the beginning. Once you do that and you mean it, you'll be surprised at how clearly you will begin to hear the word of God. I want to pray over you if you want to rise up to your feet real quick. And then I'm also going to bless the offering at this time. So Father, in Jesus' name, actually I haven't given mine. So if you're like me, why don't you just quickly go ahead and, and do that now so that we can bless it all together. Mekundesi, Mekundesi, Im Mekundesi, Mekundesi, Im Mekundesi, Karum Shtia, Im Mekundesi. Father, we thank you, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Ram So I'm in the spirit and I'm, and I'm excited. 
um, even as I was speaking, as I was giving my offering, I had this time around an angel of the Lord was repeating in English what I was saying in tongues. And he said to me that what I had just declared in tongues is that I will go through this season and I will land on my feet ready for the next. Many seasons of life have come and they have found us on our faces. They have found us in defeat. So we spend most of the season trying to recover. And by the time we recover, another season has come. And so the Lord is saying, it is best for you to be standing even at the beginning of the next season. And so I want to share that with you. Let that also be your testimony. That through this season, you will go through this season and remain standing on your feet as you welcome in the next season. The Lord is doing great things amongst us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Anybody else with another envelope before we do it? Anybody? Praise the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this moment that we have had. In your, in your presence, fellowshipping with one another and learning from your Holy Spirit through the prophetic teaching gift that you have inseminated amongst us at this time. Lord, we thank you for that and we also thank you for the opportunity to have been able to honor you once again with our substance. Lord, may it all come before you, the praises and the offerings as a sweet smelling savor in the mighty name of Jesus. There is no bird from hell and no hair of life that would take your word from our hearts as we Go on to meditate in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you all. And thanks for coming.